Um, sometimes we hear, we hear the phrase that Jesus is everything. We sang a song a little earlier on. It says, he's everything to me. And I know a song that says, Jesus is all the world to me. And, and there are a lot of songs that, are, that have been made about Jesus. But it's strange that most of us sing the songs, but we, have never, we, we, we never, for most of our lives, we never truly understood or grasped the full extent of how much Jesus means to us. I myself just began to understand the fullness of what it means about 12 years ago. And it strikes me every day that I continue to understand, it strikes me that the Christian world in general does not have a good appreciation of what God did for us in Jesus. You know, God, we say God saved humanity, but it's not just the salvation of humanity, it's everything that God has to deal to do with humanity, everything that God has to do with the universe, in fact, is channeled through Jesus Christ. And I think the more we understand the plan of salvation, the more we understand the gospel, the more we understand God and his ways, the greater appreciation we will have of Jesus. Now tonight I want to look at um, the life, the ministry, the experiences of Jesus. And I want to look under the, the heading of seven benefits in Christ. Seven benefits in Christ. Many times, or several times, I've said that most Christians focus on Calvary. They say Jesus died to save our sins on Calvary, and they point to the cross, and they wear this, this cross around their necks, some of them. But Calvary is just one aspect of what Jesus accomplished for us. Every aspect of his life, I understand, every aspect of his life was, was vitally important for me and for you, for our salvation. And so tonight I want to look at seven aspects of the life of Jesus. And, and I want to show how they are vital to our salvation, our experience, everything that is important to us. Seven aspects of the life of Christ. That if, if one of them was missing, if one of those aspects was missing, we would be sadly deficient, maybe, maybe tragically deficient in some way. So... I'm just going to look at some slides I have on the screen and I'm going to just comment on them and look at some verses and comment on the verses. So it's our first night. I won't really keep you too long, but I hope we can understand what I'm going to be trying to share. The first aspect of the life of Jesus is his incarnation. Now we know that incarnation means it means it means Jesus becoming a man. That's what the incarnation means. It means the son of God being born into flesh. That's what incarnation means. And in the incarnation, the first, great, the first great event that takes place, the first great thing that happens to us as a human race is that God has come to tabernacle with humanity. I'm going to look at the verses and then try to expand on what that really means. Okay? This is... All right, let me go to the verses. Luke 2, verses 13 to 14. It talks about when the, the angel came to the shepherds and announced the birth of Jesus. And it says, And suddenly there was with the angels a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. It's interesting. I mean, you've heard that so many times. We read it so many times. But... Here, here are some angels that God has sent from heaven. Okay, and they've sent, the, the message has come that a child has been born this night. A child has been born. It's so important that angels leave heaven to come to these men out in the field and tell them what has happened. And the angels begin to rejoice and sing. Of course they glorify God. Of course they praise God. But the second part of what they say is interesting because they say, on earth, peace, good will towards men. That's a statement from who? It's a statement from God. And it's a statement about God's attitude. Now you have to be a Jew at that time to understand the full impact of this because the Jews, like many Christians today, think of God as a great judge, as a great administrator. 
and he's watching for your mistakes so he can smite you. In fact, Muslims today have a little bit of an attitude similar to how the Jews still see and then saw God. One of the, the problems Muslims have with Christians is that we dare to say, we dare to say that God lives inside of us. That God has a son who came to live here because in their mind, God Almighty to come and mingle with dirty, sinful men, it's an impossibility. It's presumptuous. Because such a thing cannot happen. They, they, they ridicule Christianity for the very idea that God the Almighty, the Great, could come to live among men. Now we know it's not God himself who came, right? It's God's son. But at the same time, it was somebody from God's family. And, and the angels sang this song because it was a moment in the universe unique. It had never happened. It will never happen again. It was a time when the God family joined the human family forever. It's the most amazing thing that ever happened in the universe that God Almighty, his family came to, 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 to join, to become a part of the family of the creature. Look, when you think about it, we think about Calvary and we say God loved and his son and so Jesus died for us on Calvary, but the incarnation itself in that, in that, in that event, when you think about it, God did not just come to pass through, okay? He gave his son to us to be one of us forever. My brother is now the son of God. The son of God is now my flesh and blood brother. There's no other way. There's no other way that you become, could become more fully my brother than to take my genes and to be born into my race. We know what brotherhood means, okay? One of our spiritual brothers who died recently, my brother Tony. But for me, it was more than just a spiritual brother. He was, he was from my, the same womb. He was my flesh and blood. I feel things that nobody else could feel. I, I, he grew up with me as a little boy. He was my best companion. And even when he grew old and we kind of drift apart, the memories are with me that sometimes I think about it even when I'm praying and the tears come still. Flesh and blood means something. And that's what God did for us. He gave us his son to become our flesh and blood. And the angel says what it is. Peace on earth. Peace on earth. God has said to planet earth, look at how I feel about you. My thoughts towards you are thoughts of peace. Look how I think about you. I have given my son to become a part of you. Peace on earth. Brothers and sisters, can there be any greater declaration of God's attitude towards us? It's like, it's like, I'll give you an example, all right? Usually when we, when we think about ghettos, we think about places where human life is at a low state. It's where you have a lot of crime and you have a lot of drugs and you have you have, you have children growing up in debased conditions. We are happy that we don't live in ghettos. Even to visit ghettos, you have to be on your, your, your guard, some of them, because some of them are dangerous places. And I'm not disrespecting people who grow in the ghetto because it's just, they are, they, are, they, are, they are God's children just like all of us. But I'm saying that their circumstances often are less fortunate than the rest of us. You do not want your child to grow up in the ghetto. But I'll ever for you to take Daniel and take him to a ghetto, to one of these deprived families, and say, I'm giving him to live with you forever to show you how much I care for you, that you can grow my child. And if, you, if, if you're a pauper, he's growing as a pauper. And if, you, if you're education at level, you can't afford a better education. And that's what's going to happen to my son. And the dangers that are there, that's what's going to happen to him. He's going to grow as one of you and be one of you and grow up in your ghetto because I love you and I want to show you how much I love you. You wouldn't do that to Daniel. I wouldn't do that for my grandson. I, I, I don't know how I could do that. To leave him to grow up under those circumstances, how could I do this? 
This is what God did with his son. Earth was worse than a ghetto. It was enemy territory. The ruler of this planet was God's great enemy. And his determination was to destroy anything that smelled of God. And this is where God sent his son to become one of us. Not just on loan, but to be one of us forever. Permanently. If we fall, he falls. If we rise, he rises. But he really came to rise us up, to raise us up. Okay? So, but there was a danger of falling. And goodwill towards men. God is saying, goodwill. Look, you thought of me as a judge. You thought of me as somebody who was waiting to smite you. Look at my statement and know. Goodwill towards men. That's how I feel about you. And so the angels rejoiced as they sang this song. And you wonder, has the message really been understood? Has it really been heard? In Matthew 1 and verse 23, the angel announced, now Matthew is speaking about the birth of Jesus and he's quoting from Isaiah where it says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. That's what the incarnation means. This is not talking about the death of Jesus on the cross. It's talking about what happened when Jesus was born. God with us. Hallelujah. And God with us forever. So we are never alone. We are never out of his favor. How can we be out of his favor when his son is our family? How can we be out of his favor? How can he ever think negative thoughts towards us? Because his son is our family. This is what God was trying to say in Exodus 25 and verse 8. When he made this statement, it is so misunderstood because many times people look at the sanctuary and they talk about the mechanics of the sanctuary, the mechanics. But do you know what God was really saying? He says, let them make me a sanctuary that what? That I may live among them. That's what God wanted. Okay? And <laughs> there is no way that God Almighty can live among sinful men because our sin would destroy us. In his presence, our sin would kill us, okay? So what God did was, God prepared him a sanctuary, a sanctuary of flesh. God prepared a sanctuary in which he could live, in which he could be manifested so, and in, in which he could live among us and become a part of us. Jesus is God's true sanctuary in which he dwells among us. So that's his incarnation. The second aspect of Jesus experience or life that I want to focus on is his ministry. So first of all, was his, was his incarnation. Secondly, his ministry. So we move from when he was born into how he lived his life, especially after he started his ministry. In his ministry, we see God's heart revealed. And again, I say, are we seeing what God is saying through Jesus? Are we seeing what God said through Jesus? Because for, for so much of my life, I viewed God as the judge. Okay? You have this kind of inborn fear of God. And even when you, when, when you lose that fear, you have this in, inborn tendency to walk around him on tiptoes. Okay? It's like a child coming into the presence of somebody who is some great dignitary. Or somebody who is quite stern. Like... like as I mentioned the other day, when, I, when we used to go to, to, to school as boys, Brother Art, and I don't know, you must be, you're in my age, Brooklyn, so you know it is. When you go, go late, what happened? The principal stand up at the gate with his strap or with a cane, okay? I don't know if, how many of us experienced that because as time passed, the old Lord spanking. But look here, when you're going to school and when it was late, several times I hid in the bush and I didn't go to school, Okay? Nobody knew I, 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 I hid in the bush and waited to leave me and I went home. <laughs> because if, if you go to school late, the principal is standing at the gate and all the latecomers get it. Okay? Even if you, there's no excuse. So, and then the, the principal was, was the, 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 the terror of the school. When you see him that side, you go that side. Okay? You make sure that, because you don't know when he's going to find some fault with you. He might be just passing and say, tuck in your shirt. Or, or he might say, he might just find some problem with you and either give you a scolding or if he feels like it, give you a, a caning. 
Okay, I remember when I went to Cornwall, I was going to Cornwall. There was a boy sitting beside me. I was a first farmer. I was 11 years old. This boy is sitting in front of me and he's rocking back on his chair. Okay, and his chair tumbles over. The teacher says, both of you go outside. I said, I didn't do anything. He says, go outside and don't argue with me. I'm 11 years old. It's my first year in high school. Both of us go outside. Here comes the principal. <laughs> what are you boys doing outside? Go and get my cane. <laughs> then a boy ran off to get the cane. I tried to say something. No argument. Okay? Six strokes for nothing. And it was like that, you know. So, I tended to walk around the, the principal because you don't know what he's going to do next to keep out of his way. And, 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 and God was kind of like that. Okay, he's kind of like that. And to many people, he is like that. You don't know what he's going to do next. So, you kind of try to toe the line and try to keep in, in line with his rules and his orders. But still, you don't know exactly what he's going to do. So, he's somebody to be careful around. Even when you read the statements about how good he is, but you feel that you need to be on the lookout. Then Jesus, God revealed his heart. Hallelujah. John 1 and verse 18. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Or I like to say he has revealed him. All right? Nobody ever saw God. Who saw God? Moses. The Bible says Moses saw the back part of God. And that, 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 that is full of meaning too. All right? We're going to look at that on Sabbath a little more closely. But it says G nobody has ever seen God. And, and the point that John is making is that nobody can tell you what God is like. They can tell you what they've heard. They can tell you what they have read, but nobody can tell you what, is, what God is like. But the Son of God who is in the bosom of the Father, if somebody is in your bosom, you think they know what you are like? For good or for bad, my wife knows. She knows me best of all, the guy. She has often been in my bosom and vice versa. Okay? We have lived around each other for nearly 40 years now. Jesus, when it says he's in the bosom of the Father, it's talking about his vantage point in terms of what he's able to see of God. When somebody who lives this closely to another person comes and says, this is what he's like, you ought to believe. And that, that's what it is saying. Jesus has made God known. And I'll expand on that a little bit in just a moment. Look at what it says in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness had shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Where? In the face of of Jesus Christ. That's where we see what God is like. Look at Jesus, all right? If you look at Moses, if you even look at Mount Sinai, the Bible says there was lightning and thunder and all the people were fear, fearful and they were shaking in their boots. If you look at what happened, if you look at the, the Old Testament, many times you have a picture of a God who seems to be hard and uncompromising. Oh, that touch, touches the ark and he drops dead. It seems like He's very exacting and sharp. And, and there's a reason for all of this, which we are not going to deal with tonight. But what, what God is saying is, now I'm asking you to close your eyes and wipe your face clean, and I want you to look at Jesus Christ. And everything you ever saw before, I want you to put it out of the way. Because the truth about me is what you see in Jesus Christ. That's what God is saying. And I'm not saying... That what we saw in the Old Testament was false. I'm saying there is a reason. And if you don't understand the reason, you think it's two different gods. You think it's two different faces. But we have to understand why that was. And we're not going to deal with that tonight. But the truth is, we can look at Jesus and forget everything else, okay? We can forget everything else. Brother Howard has been very hard towards me. Very hard. And he hasn't been talking to me. And he has been, well, generally unkind. And one day he calls me, one side, and he says, Vid, somebody has threatened me. They have threatened to harm my family if I'm nice towards you. I'm supposed to treat you like an enemy. If I don't, 
they are going to harm my family. I'm just telling you this in quiet. But remember what you see is not the truth. The next, now Howard can do anything he wants. It doesn't bother me, right? Because now I know this is not his true face. There's a reason why this is happening. And I know that in his heart, inside, it's something different. Now, now this is what we need to understand as we look at God. In some places, for some reason, God has had to behave a certain way. But it's not the truth about him. And he comes quietly and he, he, he sends Jesus and he says, I want you to look at him. That's the truth about me. And everything else that you see, I want you to not put it up front. I want you to understand that was because of some other reason. But here is the truth about me. Hold to this and know that this is how I feel about you. And you can always deal with me according to this. That's what God is saying through Jesus. So we see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It says in, in Hebrews 1 verses 1 and 2, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time passed unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now some people have understood this to say, have, have interpreted this to say that God no longer uses prophets. But they missed the point. But the, 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 the real point of the passage is that in, in the past, God tried to make himself known. When God tried to make himself known, what did he do? He spoke through Moses. He spoke through Elijah. He spoke through Samuel, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Now, if you look at what Jeremiah or Isaiah says, or Samuel or Moses, and you think that this is the true face of God, you are going to have a wrong picture of God because none of them can give you a perfect picture of God. And that is the point. What God is saying is that all I've, I have ever wanted is that you should know me as I am. So finally, God says, finally, he has spoken to us by his son. It doesn't mean Jesus is the only prophet. It means that Jesus is a final and a full revelation of what God is. And you can look at Jesus and go put your pot on the fire. As we say in Jamaica. You can look at Jesus and go build your house accordingly. You can, you, you, you can look at Jesus and go deal with God accordingly. You can go lie down on God's bosom. When anybody tells you that God is too holy to live among sinners, run them, chase them away from you. Because Jesus ate with them, slept with them, sat in their boats, died among them. Jesus showed us that God is not too good to mingle with sinners. Because he was divine. He was the son of God. The same nature and character as the father. He was not too good to mingle with sinners. The problem with God and sinners is that sinners are too scared and too frail to stand in his holy presence. It's not that God has anything against us. It's that our attitude to God makes it impossible for God to dwell among us. So he had to come down to our level. He had to, he had to shed the glory and in his son come down to us. Because we wouldn't go to him. So he has spoken to us by his son. The third aspect of Jesus' <coughs> life is his, his, his passion. So we had his incarnation, we had his ministry, and now we have his passion. And when I say his passion, I'm using a word that is mostly used by Catholics. But I can't think of a better word, so I'm using it. Because I'm not talking about the death of Jesus. I'm talking about the experience he went through just before he died. That suffering experience he went through before he died, that's what I'm focusing on. Not the death itself. So I'm going to refer to it as his passion. When he sweat, when he sweat great drops of blood, and when he suffered in the garden and on the cross, something was happening to him that was necessary for our benefit. <coughs> What we saw was that on, in, in his passion, Jesus was wrestling with sin. Do you understand what I'm saying? He was in a struggle, hand-to-hand -hand combat of the, greatest, of the greatest magnitude. He was struggling with sin. And that's where he defeated sin, in his passion, okay? Why was he sweating great drops of blood? Why did God have to send an angel to, 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 to strengthen him? Why? What, 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 what was he going through? You mean, if, you mean he was so scared of the cross? If you think he was scared of the nails and the crown of thorns and the beating, you just don't understand. 
What he was scared of was what was happening to him at that moment. He was being separated from God. And that is what, that is what put him to the test. That is where sin tested him. Because sin was saying, sin was saying, preserve yourself. Save yourself because if you die, it's probably going to be forever. Something was happening to him that he did not understand and he did not expect. He was being separated from God. And if you are separated from God, can you ever be reunited? These are questions that Jesus did not have an answer for. And so we are told that the cup of salvation trembled in his hand. He was tempted for the first time. He really had a desire to please himself instead of God. For the first time he had that desire. All during his life, it was easy to reject the calls of self and the temptations. But now, he's tempted, strongly tempted, to, 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 to continue to exist. And so he's struggling with sin. But he defeated sin. And um, the Bible says it. In Hebrews 9 and verse 26 it says, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now, this is one of the verses that I don't know how many people understand. It was hard for me because it says that he has put away sin. And Christians will say, well, we are still sinning. And people will say, well, sin is still in the world. But the Bible says Jesus put away sin. And we're going to see what that means. Go to the next one, Daniel 9 and verse 24. Look at what it says. The angel came to Daniel and was explaining God's plan for the Hebrew nation. Seventy weeks, seventy more weeks, 490 years. Most of us understand the prophecy. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression. They'll say it didn't finish. The Jews are still transgressing. To make an end of sins. They'll say it didn't happen. The Jews are still sinning. To make reconciliation for iniquity. The Jews could not do that. That's an impossibility. To bring in everlasting righteousness. They didn't do that either. And to seal up the vision and prophecy. And to anoint the most holy. This is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. God says in 70 weeks. At the end of that 70 weeks. Jesus would do these things. He would finish the transgression. He would make an end of sins. He would bring in everlasting righteousness and make reconciliation for iniquity. But what I'm focusing on is to make an end of sin. Has, has Jesus made an end of sins? Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, in the human race, in the human race, the disease of sin has been defeated. Somebody lives, one of our family who has defeated sin on behalf of all of us. What God is saying is that at the end of the 70 weeks, somebody would come who would end the sin problem. It has been ended. And we don't judge the truth based on my experience. We judge the truth based on the word of God. We've judged the truth based on Jesus Christ. And Jesus has made an end of sin. And I'll tell you. Sometimes I think some thoughts in relation to this. That some people would say. You're bordering on blasphemy. But I think it's the truth. Okay I'm just going to touch on it quickly. I don't think. Sin is an issue with God anymore. I don't think so. I think the issue is. That we don't believe the truth. Okay, unbelief is a problem. I don't think sin is an issue. You know what God did? I don't think at the beginning sin was an issue for God. Even with Adam in the garden. You know what? I don't think so. I think sin was an issue for Adam and Eve. Do you think God, God said, you have done wrong. Don't come near me. I don't want you in my presence. Don't touch me. You have done wrong. I don't want you here. Like my grandson or your granddaughter or your son does something wrong. And you say, stay where you are. Don't come near me. You have done wrong and I don't want you near me. Which parent does that to his child? Some very hard and cruel and foolish parents, but not good parents. 
The good parents understand that, that your child messed up. That's the time he needs you. That's the time you draw him close. That's the time when you can count with him and talk with him and help him to grow out of it. God never, sin was never a problem for God. It was never God's problem. All God ever wanted was for us to come back to him, even in our condition. Okay? Like I, 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 like I said about my grandson kid, okay? I don't like when somebody messes up my place, okay? And he calls me cheerfully on the phone. I'm, I'm, I'm in America. Grandpa, I messed up the place. <laughs> Quite happy. Because he knows it doesn't matter to grandpa. He could tear down the house. <laughs> I'd be unhappy for the house, but it wouldn't affect my affection for my grandson. Or it wouldn't make me say, don't come near me. It wouldn't make me say this, okay? God is a father. God is our father. And he built into us these attitudes because they are a reflection of what he is. So, Jesus made an end of sins. In other words, Jesus took the sin problem out of the way as the basis of our relationship with God. All right? Because we feel like this, God took it out of the way. God devised a way to take it out of the way and say, look, I'm done with the sin problem. It might, if you still think it's there, I'm making a statement that you need to believe. I'm making a statement that sin is ended. I have made an end of sin. It's not a problem for me anymore. Deal with me accordingly. So look, when you mess up, go to him, see me. God, I messed up. Smile, be cheerful. He accepts you, all right? So what? Somebody says, if, if, if you think this way, you're going to take sin for granted. No. People who are born again don't take sin for granted. You may mess up, but you don't take it for granted. The people who take it for granted and who make merchandise of grace are people who are not really born again, are people who do not really love God, people who have not really experienced salvation. They say, God is so good to me. Let me go and do more evil. That is not the attitude of somebody who has really met Christ. God knows that when he says, I have set you free and sin is no longer a problem, God knows that this will make us better people, not worse people. He knows that you don't become better by living in fear. You love because you have been delivered. And this makes you the kind of person he wants you to be. So Jesus made an end of sin, so I don't need to worry myself about sin anymore because I've, it has been taken out of the way. What I need to concern myself about is unbelief. Why don't I believe the truth? Why am I having a problem believing the truth? That's a legitimate concern. So Paul says, fight the good fight of faith. That's the fight. The fourth aspect of Jesus' life, Jesus' experience was his death. So we have seen his incarnation. We have seen his ministry, his passion, and now his death. And, and, and as we can see, Take any of the first three out of the way and something is badly lacking in our experience. Number four, the death of Jesus represents the old life put to death. I don't care what you think or what you say. That's what the Bible says. Romans 6 verses 10 and 11 says, For in that he died, he died unto sin once. That's what I said. When he was passing through his passion, he was dying to sin. He was putting the old life, he was putting the, the self-life, the sin life, he was putting it to death. And when he died, he died unto sin. In other words, he died before sin could touch him. And, and just to express what that means, all right? I, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a drug user, all right? I, I smoke marijuana. I can't stop. Okay, it's, 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 it's in my bones and it's in my blood. I can't stop. No matter what I do, I can't stop. I'm addicted and then I die. Okay, you carry a pot full of it and come put it under my nose. And what? I don't move, I don't stir an inch. I am dead to marijuana. All right? It doesn't bother me anymore because I'm dead. And that's what Paul is saying. Jesus died to sin. All right? And, and when you die to something, it doesn't affect you anymore. If I'm a womanizer, I like to chase women, and I become a Christian, and I die to that, it doesn't affect me anymore. Put all the enticement in front of me, it doesn't affect me anymore. That's what it means to be dead to something. In that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Now likewise, 
Reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And what this means, when he says reckon yourself, reckon it to be so, he's saying you are to take into account all the facts. Because the word reckon is a word that is used in accounts. They say they reconcile the books. It means that you take all the numbers, you add them up, and you, 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 work, you, you make sure your figures are right, and then you come up with, with, with an answer. And your answer is correct if you have reconciled the books properly. Paul is saying, look at all the facts, and add them together, and when you come to the end, here is the conclusion you are to come to. You are dead indeed unto sin. How do you die to sin? How did you die to sin? You died to sin because Jesus died to sin and the life that died to sin, he gave it to you. So the life that you now possess is a life that died to sin and you are to reckon it to be so or you are to believe that it is so. It is true, not just that it is true that you have this new life, but it's also true that belief kill and belief cure. All right? You, 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 you believe the truth and therefore you experience the truth. You fail to believe the truth. And even though it is true, you're still living the lie. Because you don't believe the truth. If you believe you are dead to sin, sin has no more power over you. Paul says in Romans 6 and verse 7, He that is dead is freed from sin. You never see a dead man committing sin. Jesus died so that we could die to sin. That's why he died. And if he didn't die to sin, we couldn't die to sin. See, it says in verses 6 and 7, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now the first verse is knowing, knowing this. You can't know what is not true, Sister Andrea. You can think you know something and it's not so, but you can't know it. Knowledge is based on facts. So when you say know something, it has to be based on facts. Knowing this, our old man is crucified with him. The old life was crucified with Jesus. So therefore, we have that life. We have, we have death in us. We have death to, the, to sin in us. It's for us to believe the truth. The fifth aspect of his life was his resurrection. So the incarnation, his ministry, his passion, his death, and now his resurrection. In his resurrection, we experience a new life with God. You know, the Apostle Paul talks about, I want to know him. And I want to know the power of his resurrection. There are two aspects to the blessings we get out of his, his resurrection. First of all, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22. Did you know that if Christ did not raise, rise from the dead, none of us would have arise from the dead. Did you know that? People think that the resurrection is just something that God does and everybody gets up out of the grave. It's not like this. Satan had the power over the grave and over death. Not even God had the right to break in and take out the dead. But Jesus, when Jesus died and was raised from the dead, the grave took in somebody who did not belong there because the grave is for sinners. Death is for sinners and Jesus never sinned. So he had no right to die. When Satan killed Jesus, he made a mistake. He took somebody into hell that didn't belong there. He took somebody into the grave that didn't belong there. And so the grave had no right to hold him. So he was raised from the dead. And in rising from the dead, he, he, he obtained the right to raise all of us from the dead. So it says, since by man came death, by man came the resurrection of the dead. And so Jesus says in Revelation 1 and verse 18, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. When you have the key to a place, you can't let out anybody. All right? That's why they won't give you the keys to the general penitentiary 
or any of those places because they want those people to stay in there. But um, it was like that. Everybody was in prison. The whole human race. And somebody went into hell, although hell is not a place, it's a grave. But just to, to, be, to, be, to use an illustration, Jesus went into hell, broke open the door and came out and he took the key with him. So, in the resurrection, he is able to open that door and release all the prisoners. Praise the Lord. And that's why there's a resurrection. But it's not just physical resurrection. See, it says in Romans 14, verse 9, For to this end, or for this reason, Christ both died and rose. Huh? For to this end. To this end. To this end, Christ both died and rose and revived. That he might be Lord, both of the dead and the living. Interesting. Because everybody knows that Jesus is Lord of all. But do you recognize that if Jesus had not gone into the grave, he would not be Lord of the dead? He would have the power to save the living, but not the dead. So Jesus would have come and lived and died. And when he comes again, all who are alive could be taken to heaven. But all who are dead remain in the grave. So the death of Jesus is vital to our salvation, his death and resurrection. Because if he had not been raised from the dead, all of us would live godly lives and we would die. And that's it. We just stay there forever. And see, this also applies in a spiritual way because Paul says in Romans 6 and verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So it's not just physical resurrection, but what? Spiritual resurrection. So it's not just when we die that we benefit from the resurrection. It's also while we are alive, we benefit from the resurrection. We die to sin and we are raised to newness of life. That is why it's a contradiction to say somebody is a Christian and they are living the old life. It's a contradiction. You don't live the old life. When you receive the life of Christ, you are raised to newness of life. You are raised to resurrected life. You have power and authority over sin and over the works of Satan. Number six, his glorification. In his glorification, man's dominion is restored. That's maybe the hardest one out of all of them. But you know, God made man Lord of planet Earth, didn't he? God made man the Lord of this earth and he gave him dominion over everything. And what happened? Adam gave it to Satan, right? So Satan became our ruler and our king. He became Lord of this earth, God of this world. And it was like that for 4,000 years. But when Jesus defeated Satan and went back to heaven and he was glorified, he restored this dominion to us. Not just himself, but to us. Oh God, help us to understand and to believe. See what it says in Ephesians 4, verses 7 and 8. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended upon high, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts unto men. What kind of gifts did he give unto men? Gifts of the Spirit, right? The gifts of healing, the gift of speaking other languages, the gift of, the gift of teaching, preaching. They're all there in 1 Corinthians 12. And in Ephesians chapter 4, you have these gifts of the Spirit. These gifts were poured out upon his people because Jesus had been made Lord of all. Dominion and lordship had been restored to Jesus. God had put all things under his feet. And so he, he was bestowing the same authority upon his people. And so he poured out these gifts upon them. So when he was glorified, he restored the dominion to the human race. So... Whether we experience it or not, the Lord has given us authority over devils, over sickness, over disease, over death. That's what the glorification of Jesus means. When, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out, Peter said, talking about Jesus, therefore being by the right hand of God, exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he had shed forth this which you now see and hear. What they saw and heard on the day of Pentecost was because Jesus had been exalted and glorified. So if he had not been glorified, what does it say in John 7 verses 38 and 39? The Holy Ghost was not yet given. Why? 
because Jesus was not yet glorified. So Jesus had to be glorified before that power could come upon God's people. So you see, what I'm saying in all of this, brothers and sisters, the main point I'm making, and I hope you're not missing it, the main point is that what happened to Jesus happened for what reason? For our benefit. That's what I'm trying to say. Everything that happened to him happened for our benefit, okay? His incarnation, was that, that for God's benefit? Was it for Jesus' benefit? It was for our benefit. God came to become a part of our family for our sake. His ministry, he revealed who God was. It was for us again. Everything that he went through, he went through for us. And if he didn't go through, through it, something would have been missing in our own salvation and our experience with God. So, Jesus is indeed everything. He is indeed all in all. And the more we understand, the more we see how necessary it is to understand and to, and to enter more deeply into him. Of course, we know this verse very well, Revelation 12 and verse 10. When Jesus went back to heaven and threw Satan out, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. So, when Jesus went back to heaven, it was then salvation came. Strength came, not to Jesus, but to God's people. The kingdom of God came. And that kingdom of God is, a, is, the opposite, is, is in contrast to the kingdom of Satan. Satan's kingdom had dominated the world for 4,000 years because Satan, um, Adam gave the kingdom to Satan. When Satan came to tempt Jesus, he said, I'll give you all these things for it is given to me. And I can give it to anybody that I want. Okay, Adam gave it to him. But Jesus came, defeated him, and took the kingdom back from him. The final, the final aspect of his life, his, his experience that benefits us, is his priestly ministry. And his priestly ministry enables us to what? To live in the glory of God. He's not in heaven ministering for his benefit or for God's benefit. He's ministering for our benefit. And this ministry means that we, we don't just experience God's glory for a moment. We walk in that glory continually. That's what the ministry of Jesus means. It says in Hebrews 7 verse 25, Wherefore, he's able also to save them to what? To the utmost, the, the highest point, the greatest extent, to the ultimate extent, he's able to save those who come to God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. It's interesting that he says those who come to God by him, because some come some other way, don't they? And if you come to God some other way outside of Jesus, he's not able to save you to the uttermost. He's not able to save you at all. But those who come to God by him, he's able to save them to the uttermost. And so it says in Hebrews 10, our last verse, Hebrews 10, verses 10 to 22, 19 to 22. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest. I'm not sure I should say holiest. It really means to enter into God's presence. Having therefore, boldness to enter into the very presence of God. By the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. Of course, there's an old dead way, okay? The old dead way was the blood of bulls and goats. The old dead way was through my works. But there's a new and living way by which I can come to God, which is the blood or the life of Jesus. By a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil. That is to say, his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us... Draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Hallelujah. Look here. The word of God says we must come home. With boldness. Look here. Step in. Make noise when you're coming in. All right? Walk in like you belong. Walk in like it's your yard. You're coming into the presence of God. What he's saying is, don't hang down your head. 
Don't creep in like a culprit, barely pardoned. Don't come in saying, oh, I'm a sinner. No. Come in with boldness because you're not coming on the basis of what you have done, who you are, or the works you have done, or the blood of bulls and goats. You have a new and living way, the life of Jesus Christ. And what that life has done, we've just been looking at some of the things, okay? It certifies that you are children of the living God. Is your daddy. You can come and say, daddy, I messed up the place. And laugh. And you know you're accepted. You know you're accepted. He's not putting you out. He's not frowning at you. That's what Jesus says to us about God. And he says we have to come with boldness by this new and living way. We have this way. And this way is his flesh. This way through the veil. Because you see, there always was a veil that hid man from God. Even in the sound period, there was this veil, there was this curtain. So nobody could go beyond that curtain except one man, one time for the year. And him better come good. He better step in there with fear and trembling. They better tie a rope around his foot in case he drops dead inside here. They can't pull him out. Okay? We don't come anything like that. We come with boldness through that veil because it's our family. We have been adopted into his family by his son, by the blood of Christ. We come by a new and living way. So come boldly. We come in full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Let me just stop a little bit on the evil conscience. Let me just say the final, the final outrageous thing. Okay, I t- touched on it earlier, but I, it, keeps, it, ke- it, it keeps circling my mind. Okay? You have two ways to deal with an evil conscience. Two ways. One is to change your behavior so that you never again do anything wrong. All right? So, because you don't do anything wrong, your conscience is clean. All right? That's one way. I'm not going to ask you to put up your hands, the people who are in that condition. But I'm tempted to ask, and I want you to think about it. Those who have a clean conscience because you have no scar on that conscience, put up your hand in your mind. But I'm willing to bet nobody did, okay? I'm willing to bet nobody did. The second way to have a clean conscience is to know that the person in whose eyes you can be guilty has completely eliminated guilt. He has taken guilt out of the way so that guilt can never again be an issue between you and that person. That's the second way. And that's the way that very few people are willing to undertake to look at But the more I understand the grace of God in Christ, the more I'm persuaded this is what God did. God said, I'm going to give you a clean conscience. How far? One one group of people said, look, I'm going to make you live perfect without a flaw. Okay? So they chased that dream all their life. I was on that road, so I know. They chased it all their life, and they never get there. I'm not saying... It is not, it should not be our desire and purpose to live without a a flaw. I'm not saying that. That's not the point. Because that is my intention too, and it should be the intention of everybody who loves the Lord. But what I'm saying is, scripturally, what God has done, God has said, I said, look, you see where sin is concerned? I'm going to deal with it for you, finally and forever, once and for all, and I'm taking it out of the way. You can't sin in a way that's going to separate me from you anymore. You can't. All right. The first time I said something like this, a friend of mine says, Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Your iniquities have separated between you and your God that he will not hear you. And I said to him, that was before Jesus came. And he didn't like that. (laughs) But it's the truth. How can sin separate you from God when God has dealt with every single sin that was ever committed or that will ever be committed? How can sin still be an issue when God says that Jesus put an end to sin? How can something that is ended still be an issue? And so God is saying, look, I've dealt with the conscience problem. You don't have a problem anymore with your conscience if you believe the truth. So we can come with a clean conscience, right? 
When my grandson says, Grandpa, I messed up the place. You think when I come back from, from overseas and he sees me, he's going to go to hide? Look, he's running into my arms just the same. He's going to want to know what did I bring for him just the same. He's going to know that I love him just the same. His little messing up the place can't do anything to bring any barrier between me and him. How could God be harder than I am? How could God make our, 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 our issues be a barrier when he said he took care of it? So when the Bible says come with a clean conscience, it means that we come to God. Not because we have never done wrong. Not because we have stopped transgressing, which we do sometimes. But we come to God with a clean conscience because God has cleansed the conscience. God has done something to make sure conscience is not a problem between us and him anymore. He has taken sin out of the way as a separating agent. You understand what I'm saying? Sin no longer can separate you from God because God dealt with it in Jesus Christ. The only thing can separate you from God is your unbelief. And it's not because it separates God from you. It's because it separates you from God. It's because it makes you so afraid of him. And so tentative around him. You're walking on tiptoe around him. You're afraid lest he smite you. When he has not the least intention to do something like this. This is why Jesus said you shall know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. Anyway, that's where we are going to end tonight. Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, is not just everything in name, but in reality and in fact, he is everything. God help us to believe and to live by this belief.